Welcome everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to be talking about health, the future of health, the changes that need to happen there. And to do that, uh, we have two seed camp companies that are absolutely the cutting edge of this space, Sanogenetics and Humanity. And I will have the, the, the founders introduce themselves and then we'll kick things off. Maybe let's start off with you, Patrick. Great. Thanks, Carlos. It's really great to be part of the podcast and thanks for having us on. So I'm Patrick. I'm the uh, CEO and one of the three co-founders of Sonogenetics. Um, in a nutshell, we're a company that matches patients to precision medicine research. We have a software platform that does the personalized matchmaking and gives reports to people based on their genetic data. We also have at-home testing kits that allows patients to participate in research um, from anywhere. So there's the combination of digital and at-home testing. Um, and I'll take, give it to Charlotte to give a quick introduction of herself as well. Hi, I'm Charlotte and I'm the COO at Sanogenetics. I'm one of three co-founders with William, who is the CTO of the company. Excellent. Michael. Yeah, so uh, our company is Humanity. Uh, we want to give people basically a concrete feedback loop and allow them to find out what actions they should be taking on a daily basis to basically slow their aging is the way that we give it to them, but basically reduce the probability of disease and stay healthy. Uh, and right now there's not really any concrete feedback loop out there for people that they can get access to. Uh, and so I founded that with uh, Pete Ward uh, and uh, both of our backgrounds are pretty much in consumer tech doing quite large you know, kind of 100 million user kind of uh, uh, direct to consumer uh, services. Uh, and we both became quite obsessed with preventive health uh, about 10 years ago. And that kind of started our journey towards uh, creating humanity. Well, maybe maybe we can pick up the ball from from that point, Michael. Um, one of the things that some people have heard me say in the past uh, regarding this space is that the biggest challenge we have in humanity is helping people move from reactive health to proactive health. How do we just stop always just one being one step behind helping solve the world's health issues and then get one step ahead. And, you know, it sounds like that was a similar approach that, that, that catalyzed the creation of humanity. What, what's your take on what needs to happen there, Michael? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. So I, I will say that we've seen with say, like here in the UK with the NHS and others, like budgets have started to shift towards, uh, preventive health because they understand that trying to you know uh, just extend someone's you know life at the end and not at a high quality instead of actually giving them a high quality of life for longer is just not where we should be spending all the money. Um, I think what needs to change is actually kind of getting people more uh, enfranchised back into their health. Uh, I think the you know we've all had this experience if, we, if when you're trying to be more proactive in your health you you Google some stuff, you, you start taking some tests, you kind of then you try to go to the people that you trust with your healthcare, the, you know, your, your doctors. Uh, and a lot of times that experience is, is a bit rough because, you know, on their side, they, they feel like you're kind of like telling them their job. And, and on your side, you're feeling like this person's not really kind of engaging with me. Um, and I mean, not to be overly biased, but I think some of the direct to consumer things that allow people to engage a bit more in their health is a good step forward. Uh, and then integrating that better into the, the healthcare system and the doctors when that's needed as a next step in certain situations. I think that's all happening. Uh, we just need to kind of accelerate it. And then, you know, I think everybody on this call today is kind of, uh, you know, working towards that. I mean, I don't know if Charlotte or Patrick, you guys want to comment on that, but I mean, I think some of the areas that I would be keen on hearing your thoughts on is that level of engagement that is needed from the practitioners the doctors to really um, make this official, to make anybody who is feeling like they want to take things like their genetic tests or their blood tests um, personally and, and accountable for it, that, that the practitioners don't dismiss that or see it as uh, fear mongering. Yeah, I, I, I can add a little something on top of that. And I think Charlotte probably will as well. Um, for us as a company, we've often described ourselves as direct to consumer research. Um, there's direct to consumer genetic testing companies that you can purchase kits from for ancestry and, and other kinds of predictions. We try to take that same feeling and inject it into the research process. Um, and a lot of patients or, or healthy people who have participated in research have a really frustrating experience. And this has a knock on effect in 
clinical trials failing because they can't attract enough people, has a knock-on effect in large-scale research studies taking forever and, and not being able to find the things that they're expecting to find because they can't really engage people because there's nothing in it for them. Um, I think they're, I'm also an optimist and there are a lot of institutions that are starting to recognize that actually the, the customer at the end of the day is the, the patient or the research participant um, and they're coming around to systems that put that patient at the center. So we've been working with Genomics England a lot recently, which is the UK's um, national, national genomics arm effectively. And, and they're responsible for doing a lot of the testing in rare disease. And they've always been very patient focused. They have patients as part of their steering board. Um, and I think it is changing, but it, but it takes a long time because a lot of the systems are, you know, have, have been baked over a very long period of time. Yeah, um, I'll add something to that. You asked Carlos, you know, what needs to change for doctors to actually act on patients' desire to uh, be empowered to look after their health. And I think that comes back to building a health system and a research system that is patient-centric. Uh, there used to be this model where patients would go to the doctor and, and whatever doc the, the doctor said was gospel, you know, because you didn't know better, but more and more patients are educated. So when they're diagnosed or where someone in their families suffer from an illness, they want to understand. They want to understand how that works, why they're being affected, what is the risk to their children, to their family members. Um, and they want information. So really when we built Sano, a big thing for us was to put uh, this patient experience at the core of what we do. So we, we work on accelerating the pace of research because with a research background, we, we genuinely believe that progressing research in precision medicine is the way forward to make uh, medicine more proactive and less reactive. But the key to that is to engage patients from the onset. It's to give them the ability to control how their data is used, to understand what we're learning from the studies they participate in, uh, and for them to also get some sort of insight as well in terms of engaging with the research pro process. It's not just an altruistic pursuit, but it's also about them getting some actionable points out of their participation and learning whether they're more susceptible to react to a specific drug or to a treatment and really be at the center of what we do. Mm. I think, I mean, we covered a lot already, but now we're going to touch upon some of the probably the most sensitive parts of, of this chat, which is the way that there's multiple parties that have vested interests in the system as it is at the moment. And some people would argue pharmaceuticals are at the center of that. Other people would argue that insurance companies are the center of that. And others would argue that government and regulations behind that. I don't know if you guys want to maybe... Um, go through and, and take a view on that but being that we were just talking about pharmaceuticals a little bit uh with with uh what you were saying charlotte maybe you can kick off but basically what is the role of of pharmaceuticals regulatory bodies and insurance companies in all of this and what needs to be done and changed there to really drive that change yeah, that's a great question. It is a complex ecosystem and I think the answer will vary widely as well between countries. So for example, the US has a whole different ecosystem from what we used to here in the UK with the NHS. And I'll, I think all of these players have a role to play. However, they tend to have bad press. There has been a lot of cases, you know, that have made it into the public that have created a lot of distrust towards big pharma and towards uh, regulatory bodies in general. And, you know, with good reasons. So again, I'll, I'll go back to what I was saying before. To me, the real way of fixing this, and this is at the core of the philosophy at Sano, is to put the patient in control and to move away from that model where we think that individuals don't understand, it's better not to involve them in the decision making, and to actually be very clear about what we're learning about the disease that they have or the predispositions that might run in their families. How can we improve it and how they can be an actor in that? Because by putting individuals in the driving seat, you actually give real incentives for the data to be up to date, for the research to progress in the direction and for insights to become actionable. 
one of the big problem with research is there is a lot of findings and there isn't that much of that that makes it back to the public. So we publish a lot of papers, but then the accountability of taking that and actually turning it uh, into something that makes a difference for patients is sometimes missing. So by making the whole process transparent to patients, we actually suddenly have advocates, you know, that are at the core of the process and move the needle forward. So I think more transparency is the answer with the patient at the center. So, so transparency. And Patrick will probably want to add something to that. Yeah, so transparency and advocacy. But maybe, Michael, you can give us your thoughts on, on that, specifically with regards to, if you assume, I know that humanity is going to help a lot with the idea of uh, information transparency and, and informing patients in their journey and how it impacts their health. But what, what role do you see pharmaceuticals playing in this and, and regulation in enabling it to happen? Uh, I mean, I, I guess I see everything kind of from, you know, and it's kind of a what happens when you're in the consumer tech space, but, uh, you know, everything's distribution. And I think uh, what happens, you know, I, I started spending a lot of time with scientists when I started getting obsessed with preventive health. Uh, and a lot of those conversations, it was basically that they, they, only, they only understood one distribution path, which was basically I, I come up with some amazing breakthrough and then I need to find you know, a pharmaceutical company because they basically had the distribution out to the doctors and, and that sort of thing. I think having that single distribution path has definitely kind of warped a lot of attention towards you know, kind of disease only, not preventive. You know, it's, it's had a lot of effects because that was the only way that we could really get all our discoveries out there. I think going direct to consumer or just creating other distribution paths that don't go through pharma, pharma companies actually will have, and I, I think something that Charlotte was touching on, like will have this effect of having it, making it more user-centric, patient-centric, as, as she said. Uh, and I think the thing that we see even with kind of the early days of kind of consumer tech, health tech plays is a lot of it the front end for the user wasn't actually bringing them that much value. It was kind of more, a, you know, a data collection play. Uh, and I think, but as we go, uh, we're seeing more and more that the actual, you know, health tech direct to consumer application needs to actually bring a lot of value to that one user, you know, put in science terms, like the N equals one needs to have some value there. But in the, in the action of doing that, you can actually collect a lot of data. You can do a lot of stuff that actually powers the research that will then bring, you know, you know, full circle the, you know, the next breakthrough. So I, I think that whole play and in kind of increasing those distribution paths is, is starting to actually appear. Um, and I think that, honestly, I think that's the best way forward. The more, you, the more you're trying to bring a value to that N equals one, that one user, the more you just start to make decisions that are better for them uh, because that's, you know, that's kind of how the consumer market works, right? So. And what, what do you see as, do you, you know, what, I asked this a little earlier with regards to the insurance, but where do you see, companies like Vitality that are pushing proactive measures through Fitbits and whatnot, what do you see their role in catalyzing all of this? Or is it more of a red herring? Patrick? Uh, no, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's really different about healthcare and, and medicine in general is there's a, it's not always clear who is paying and who should be paying and, uh, and how to, how to align incentives appropriately in the system. And I think the examples you've given around preventive versus reactive insurance companies, national healthcare systems, it's very different country by country. And I think any successful model needs to recognize that um, in the US, for example, the market is driven by services and, and continually marking up those services. There are other integrated healthcare systems like, like you know, the NHS, for example, where conceivably something that's proactive is is potentially money saving but i think one of the challenges we still run into here in, in the uk for example is there's a cash crunch now for the national healthcare system so something that saves money in 10 years through prevention is really hard to fund now because there's a there's a cash shortage now so you have to be looking for double triple quadruple wins where you, where there's something in it for the patient there's something in it for the healthcare system, there's something in it for the payer, which might be the healthcare system or might not. Um, and then there's something in it for the company who's providing it, whether it's the, the pharmaceutical company, a, a, a tech company or, or whoever. And finding that quadruple alignment, I think is often, is often really challenging. Yeah. 
Um, well, I'm going to take a quick tack away from, from insurance and regulation for a second and going back to what you guys are doing individually. Um, I'd love to hear maybe uh, Charlotte or Patrick and then maybe you, Michael. Fast forward three years, four years, you guys are doing extremely well. What is the exact suite of services that um, a patient would or, or, or a person would come to you for and associate you with? Just maybe a little bit more detail on, on what that would look like. What would my relationship with Tanner look like? What would my relationship with humanity look like? I can take a stab at that and then Charlotte, you can correct me if, uh, if you see it differently. So our, our approach has been to try to build the, the best place for patients to find and access new research and, and insights. Um, and on the flip side, the best place for researchers to find the patients that they need to power their precision medicine research studies, whether those be the proactive or reactive. So in three, four years time, we're hoping to be able to support dozens, if not hundreds of distinct disease areas. Right now we focus in autoimmune disease, neurology, and a handful of rare diseases, but we wanna expand this as time goes on. Um, and where, where we'd like to transform the industry is to a place where instead of it taking years, millions of dollars to put together a new research study to test does, you know, does this potentially life-saving compound work or does this new preventive measure work across tens of, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that you can spin this up in a matter of minutes, weeks, or months in a way that uh, allows you to find participants, find data, and close that loop between scientific discovery and deployment into healthcare in a, in a really rapid way and in a way that puts the, the people ultimately who are powering that research project in, in control of the process and their their sensitive data. Mm. Yeah, I, I think to add to that, we're seeing something really interesting right now uh, with COVID-19 in the sense that there are, you know, research projects being expedited at a pace that we've never seen before. We have vaccine trials, you know, being going on in every country, moving into phase two, uh, treatments being tested in clinical trial sites everywhere in the country. And that's out of necessity to contain an epidemic. But from our perspective, we are building the sort of infrastructure that would enable to do that in every disease area so that it doesn't take 15 years Yes, to start a research project and effectively get a drug out of it it but actually identify you know the genetic basis that makes some people more responsive less responsive that have worse symptom progression to quickly fast track them uh, to be able to do drug repurposing or anything else you know that involves uh, uh, testing potential treatments and have this sort of, uh, of of answers coming up you know in a really uh, in a really fast manner. Um, so yeah, we're basically building tech infrastructure to make the sort of things that we're seeing in a disparate way happening with COVID-19 uh, uh, trials, but in a centralized way and systematically for every disease. And before we move on to, to Michael, I just wanted to get a quick prediction from you. When is it going to be, what year will it be when we have personalized medicine is mainstream, where the drug that I'm taking is different for me than it is for you? When's that happening? I, I will say that actually it's already here for a number of conditions. Um, if you have, uh, if you or some one of your family members has cancer, uh, you're getting precision, at least precision, potentially not personalized, but uh, cancer in many ways is 10 to 15 years ahead of other diseases. You're getting specific therapies based on the molecular markers. Um, in rare disease, it's also the case. There are now a number of rare diseases that have extremely targeted gene editing based approaches that are the condition may be one in a million or one in a hundred million, um, but that patient's getting something incredibly personalized. So I think for some, it's already here. For things like um, diabetes, uh, you know, chronic later stage conditions. I think we're going to see precision medicines, which might be, you know, diabetes is no longer one disease, but it's 10. Um, we'll certainly see that within the next decade. Whether we see fully personalized therapies is in your, your scanned. I don't know, I would put that at um, 10, to, 10 to 20, maybe rather than five to 10, but I'd be interested in other people's thoughts. Well, Michael, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what humanity, assuming humanity, you know, is in five years, the, the number one place for, people to come and manage a lot of their health. What, what, what's it gonna look like? What's that customer experience gonna look like? I mean, it's, it's built on just 
collaborating and getting better and better models that will tell the person exactly how their, you know, how their health is going is if their probability of disease is going up or down, is their full functional body getting stronger or weaker? Um, I think the, you know, the stuff that we, I was waiting for my daughter to show up. Uh, so the, the stuff that we're, I think that's going to be the kind of progressive iterative thing that becomes better and better. Uh, I think one of the things that I, since we're like looking to the future, I think something that Charlotte touched on is something that kind of was an impetus for creating humanity too, is when I started spending a lot of time with these scientists, like the top names in science, like the ones that you like hear about, or, you know, you know, they, they become famous because of their breakthroughs. They spend like 90% of their careers just trying to get the data to then do the research that you then get the breakthrough from. Right. And so what I see happening and I want humanity to be a big part of that is pushing forward to allow privacy preserving, you know, easier access to all people to, to these data sets. And that, that comes through federated learning where you're basically kind of model training across kind of disparate siloed data sets. That data is not moving anywhere central. It's just staying where it is. And also kind of differential privacy and other ways to make sure that those models are not bringing with it raw data. So I think what we're sitting kind of on the edge of right now and, and to the question of what's humanity going to do here, basically becoming one of those kind of consortiums that then prove that this is not just a theoretical exercise and it's not just Google using it to give you better predictive text. Actually, this in the healthcare space is a thing we've all been waiting for, is that time that we can actually build models, whether it be predicting cancer or better treatment paths for cancer or you know, rate of aging so that you know exactly how you're doing health-wise building those models across all these, this health data without any of those people losing their ownership and their privacy to that data. And I could ramble on for another two hours about that subject, but I think that's, if we're looking three years ahead, I think we look back and be like, wow, things really accelerated because access to data through kind of mechanisms that Sano has and this kind of, also these kind of federated and kind of differential privacy type setups, these protocols will allow, you know, for these access, the same thing the internet did, to, to data, you know, if if we were still sitting here asking DARPA or someone's, you know, permission to kind of get onto the internet and and you know and access stuff, we wouldn't have moved forward. And that's kind of where we are right now with health data. You kind of have to make these big, expensive deals. You got to be on the inside to actually get access to the data that you need to actually, you know, make the learnings that will save people's lives. And I think we're on the verge of that changing. So, excellent. And, and is there a low hanging fruit of data that? should be unlocked is there what is the low-hanging fruit that can be lobbied for by startups in health to get over the line and we're all benefiting from it i would pass it to sano because i think genetics is probably the space that i've seen the most kind of movement yeah well i'm gonna flip it back to you michael because i was curious with your with your model what what i can imagine but I think I'll just ask you, what kind of data um, do you incorporate or plan to incorporate? Hopefully genetics, but probably other info as well. No, you'll be happy with my answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. G genotyping is, is definitely there from day one. Uh, DNA methylation actually as well uh, to see what you know, genes are kind of on or off. Um, but we want to be as radically inclusive as possible. Uh, so we, we, you know, digital markers are, are a huge part of that. But really what ends up happening is can you kind of create these mappings between, you know, the, the genetic markers, the digital markers, and that stuff like your accelerometer, your steps, your, your, your heart rate, uh, and the outcomes that happen in these, in these, you know, data sets. So basically what happens to people in the future? So you kind of know what their markers look like 10 years before they had a heart attack or 10 years before something happened to them. Uh, and I think all of those will play a part, but really when it gets to how do we distribute it out, out to as many people as possible, I think the genetics, as we've seen, it's gone from $3 billion to, to, you know, $300 or $200. Uh, so, yeah, I think genetics will be able to play a big part in that because the price will be out of there. But the, uh, the, the digital markers will obviously be a big part. And that, that from day one is a big part of our model. So. Maybe moving a little bit in towards what generates the data. If you look at a lot of the, I mean, I'm oversimplifying this, so guys, don't beat me up. But if you look at you know, there is a problem somebody might have, or they don't know they have. There is a diagnostic, or rather there is um, a process of getting that information out of that person. There is the diagnostic from that data, 
then there is the addition of that data plus the diagnostic metadata onto a form of ledger. And then from there on out, there is intersection of pharmaceutical to that, intersection of insurance company to that, practitioners that do something to that, and then there's outcome. And then there, that outcome feeds back into the data pool because the two things get correlated on the outcome, right? And if you look at each one of those things, we've kind of covered some of those. And I just wanted to ask you what still needs to exist or need to, needs to be developed at the diagnostic level to really add more, more visibility and granularity to this, these data sets so that you really have a full picture for both of your startups to succeed. So I will, I will say maybe two main areas. And the first you've, uh, you've kind of touched on already, which is breaking down the different silos of data. So the way I wish the process was how you just described it and that there was some ledger where everything's written to. Unfortunately, half of it is with your GP, half of it's with hospitals, half of it's on your phone. Um, some of it's not recorded by anyone um, and people are misdiagnosed. So, so the quality of data is a challenge and how it's siloed across the ecosystem is a challenge. So having better ways to have my data on an individual level, um, have all of it accessible through a single place is, is kind of a table stakes for anything like this to happen. Um, and then I think the second is, is then better, whether it's data types or, or algorithm approaches on top of that, you know, presumed group of data to do earlier detection. So things like early detection of cancer. Um, we've got a little one in the background. That's great. Uh, early detection of cancer, for example, is, is a holy grail of, uh, you know, of, of preventive care that many companies with huge war chests around the world are funding. But it's, it's very challenging because you, you, know, you have to detect a minuscule amount of cancer DNA in the blood or protein in the blood many years before it actually manifests as a cancer. Um, and so the, the level of precision required to do that is, is incredibly challenging. So I, I said the quality of the data absolutely needs to be there first. And then only then can you start to layer these new approaches on top. Well, maybe, so it, assuming that quality is obviously important, I don't know, Charlotte, you might've been about to say something, but basically I'm trying to get to the sense of like, are we at the point where technologically speaking, getting that information out. It's, it's siloed, it's all broken, it's all misorganized, but actually this, the extraction, right? That's the word I was looking for. Extraction of that information has now become basically cost-effective across anything that you want. I would, uh, I would say yes. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, I definitely think that. Sorry, Michael. I definitely think that's the case. I mean, when it comes to genetics, it's not really something that can become part of the uh, everyday toolkit, you know, for precision medicine. And one thing I wanted to add to Patrick's words is actually that besides the quality of the data and how it's organized, it's also longitudinal data collection that will make a big difference. So having a baseline, basically, and I think probably Michael will, will agree with that, given he's looking at tracking markers over time. But one thing that happens when you go to the doctor is you get a blood test and the results tend to be measured over, uh, you know, against a population average, which is, you know, great to get a sense of things, but not very precise to you and who you are and how it was three months ago. So I think having that baseline and collecting data over time is, is also fundamental. And yes, to your question, I do think we are at a time where technologically it's very feasible to collect all of this data in a cost efficient manner. So it's right for disruption and the challenge now for startups like ours uh, is to actually build the infrastructure to extract meaningful information from this so it's no longer about the technology to collect the data but it's about um, sort of laying laying up the intelligence on top of it in terms of what it is that we're trying to find from it what are the questions that we need to answer and how do we set up an infrastructure to extract those in a way that is meaningful on you know over the long term Michael, do you want to comment on that? I just wanted to, while you're, while you're thinking about what, what, what might be a perspective on that, um, I, I mentioned the question about diagnostic because we're investors in a company called Ezra.ai, which is trying to democratize MRIs as a way of diagnosing like a larger set of things. And I was just curious as to whether Cong or not- Congrats guys, on that, by the way. Uh, thanks. Very happy for you. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because like, you, know, you, you look at that and you think, well, that is a tool, but it's too expensive. And, and I'm- curious as to like, for example, with humanity being a bit of a, uh, a Switzerland, 
with data silos that you're trying to make intelligence from, but not necessarily invested in the, in the extraction tools themselves. Um, I'm just curious as to what would be in your wish list, Michael, to, to really move things along quickly and colla uh, collated with the data sets that are cleaned and, and correlated would lead to like a far more effective outcome for your patients. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to complain at all because I mean, we honestly started building, you know, just a, you know, a few months ago and we, for everything we needed to do, there was a service provider that could help us do it quicker and faster. There's a service provider that has done all the work to integrate with all the electronic health records. You know, when we want to integrate that, there's a service provider, you know, there's, there's, there's friction in many of those places, but it, a lot of the stuff is there for someone like, like us to kind of come in. And as Charlotte said, is the important part now is to leverage it and actually, you know, allow it to make a difference. It's not the it's not that the the infrastructure there's there's enough infrastructure there now for us to be quite effective in what we want to do, which is bring better health outcomes to to directly to consumer. Um, I think if I had a wish list, uh, you know, if if anybody's watching this and they have some great kind of like mini mass spec machine in your pocket that you can just take a you know digital image of your blood as opposed to kind of having to like send it off to a lab, that would I think that would be the kind of the the end all, and I wouldn't actually have any wishes past that point. Uh, I think COVID has uh, done something very, you know, it's been tragic worldwide. And the, one of the biggest positives, if you can find one in it, is that it's, it's made people start thinking about things like how do we bring, you know, healthcare directly to consumers, or at least do blood tests remotely, as opposed to you can only do that in the hospital. It's done things like, okay, how do we actually preserve the privacy of everybody's data in the NHS and get learnings from it so that we can save people's lives? Uh, because I think a lot of the concentration, I, you know, I just moved back to London, a, you know, like a year and a half ago, there was just so many, there had been put in place all these ways to keep the data safe, but not leveraged at all. So it's just like, I had to sign five forms when I signed up for my local surgery to like say, okay, I'm going to get, I'll allow that part of the NHS to have it and that part. And I, and I know they saw that as like a good thing, but what they kind of, I feel like they missed out in part of that process was, okay, how do we actually make my healthier? <laughs> Not just keep my data safe, but like actually make me healthier. And so I think there's, as we move forward, my wish is that we, those two components come into every single conversation that every single, you know, board of whatever health uh, body kind of keeps in mind is how do we, yeah, keep the data safe, but how do we actually you know, save some lives at, at the same time, because that data is super valuable if you, if you use it in the right way. So, so I wanted to, to ask two more questions before we wrap up. Um, the first one's quite heavy. Um, and it has to do with the two trajectories people currently understand to help solve many of, of issues that involve medicine, if you will. Um, one of them is the pharmaceutical track. We talked about pharmaceuticals as a whole. Now I'm talking about their product in, in sense you know, you've been diagnosed, data has been correlated and here's this outcome and here's this drug, the drug's been hyper uh, targeted for you. Um, and then there's, you know, an increase in people's awareness of the role that nutrition has in preventing and or solving some of the very same things that pharmaceuticals are doing. And I just want to understand your perspectives about where do you think the future of food will play in tandem with pharmaceuticals, not, not at the, the sort of traditional cliche sort of weight loss or anything like that. I'm talking about at the, at the almost medicinal level, effectively coming full circle and looking at um, not alternative medicine, but alternative forms of medicine to, to, to work in conjunction with uh, medicines or replacing them. Yeah, I, I, I think there is a lot of potential in that and it needs to be a rigorous process the same way that pharmaceutical drugs are being tested. You know, there needs to be research and clinical trial that really get to the bottom of, you know, what makes a difference. And, and I think patient stratification is key in that because you often hear sort of anecdotal experiences from people saying changing to this diet or doing this has made a huge difference you know, in my symptoms or in my well-being, but what works for one person might not work to others. So I think the research on, on nutrition uh, and, and other alternative medicines sometimes is a bit frowned upon as being unscientific. I reckon there is still 
a lot to be done on that front, provided that we actually stratify patients better. So don't put everyone in one pool, uh, put them on a diet and then conclude it works or doesn't work, but actually try to understand in the subgroup for whom that works, you know, what are the common traits? Is there a genetic basis that we can find in common? Uh, is there, you know, a sort of environmental factors that they share that make that diet or other uh, potential therapy effective? So I think there needs to be a scientific approach to that. And the key, the key to that, again, is, is finding the right patients to take part in the right studies. I, I will echo that. And I say I think we will see a widespread shift towards value-based pricing in both the pharmaceutical industry and, and hopefully in healthcare more generally, where, um, and, and it's slow, and people have been saying this for a long time, but I think it will happen, is that the pharmaceutical company, for example, will no longer be paid per dose, but they'll be paid uh, upon the outcome. And this is already happening with some of the CRISPR gene editing therapies where, where they, they back their therapy so much that they say, you only have to pay if we cure the patient. And I think that everybody's aligned there. The healthcare system saves money, the patient gets better, the pharmaceutical company makes their money. And I think we could argue the same with um, you know, some of these preventive approaches. If there's a company that really um, wants to put their money where their mouth is, uh, for lack of a better word, in terms of some kind of large scale preventive tool that's based on integrating data or, or changing diet or something like that, then, then maybe they could take the, um, what's, the what's the company in, in the Bay Area that does the software engineering courses? Um, they can basically say it's free to do and you only pay us if you succeed. Um, someone will, will remember what that company's called, but some kind of business model that says you only pay for success, um, I think could be transformative if, um, if, if you're able to do that. Michael, any, any views on, on that, especially as you, you're dealing with people's data across multiple facets, not just medicinal? Yeah, I think the, I think the more macro thing, and we touched on it earlier, is that the entire, and we don't, it's not really talked about that much, but the entire system is built on the fact that it would have been too expensive to monitor everybody. And so we kind of have to get a cohort of people and then we have to extrapolate to 7 billion people. <laughs> and we kind of have this continual kind of like small cohort of people extrapolate to 7 billion people. And, and if you ask any of the scientists that did any of those clinical trials, they would tell you point blank, yes, of course, this is exactly what the trial said. It did not say this, but we continually try to apply it to 7 billion people. I think the fact of the matter is we now can monitor everybody. Uh, you know, within reason, we could basically can do that for a fairly low price, uh, or at least, you know, sampling uh, that's much greater than what we have with the, just the clinical trials. I think that is, you know, back to your question of like, what can kind of usher in finally kind of precision medicine is we finally have that infrastructure that we can fairly cheaply, uh, you know, monitor everybody so that we know, is this thing working for this person or not, so that we don't have these proclamations of, sugar is bad for you, fast bad for you, you know, red meat's bad for you. Uh, like all this, all this stuff is, we should know better than, than to do that anymore, although we, we kind of have some momentum in that direction, so we keep doing it. We need to understand that sugar is bad for some people, you know, too much sugar is bad for some people, red meat's really bad for some people, doesn't really affect other people that much. Um, and I think that's what we're gonna see as, as we move forward, and that's what we should push for uh, is actually keeping all of ourselves from making those statements anymore and really saying, well, if you want to find out if that thing's working for you, you need to check this. Or if you want to know the best way forward on nutrition, you need to have this test and this test, and you need to monitor yourself, you know, in this frequency. Um, and that's, that's what we hope to play a big part in with humanity. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the genetics is obviously a big part of that. Um, but also just, you know, the, the digital markers will play a big part of that. You see Aura Ring is doing a ton of stuff with you know, they had asymptomatic, uh, this kind of quoted uh, asymptomatic people were infecting people with COVID. But if you actually looked at like their, you know, their heart rates and their, and their body temperature, you could have known that they were symptomatic of something, you know, days earlier. And I think all this stuff is starting to actually show because of COVID that we have this ability to monitor more people and using that can save lives. So it's, uh, I'm, again, very optimistic that we're, we're heading in that direction pretty quickly. Well, guys, thank you so much. It's been super insightful. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's a hundred more questions that we could probably go on for another hour, but 
if um, if people wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, for me, just yeah, email me. My name is Michael Gear. It's mg at humanity dot email. Uh, so yeah, ping me. Cool. For uh, for me, they can also email me. It's Patrick at sonogenetics dot com. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Patrick underscore J underscore Short, and the company is Sonogenetics. Excellent. Well, I think Charlotte, maybe we'll include you as part of Patrick's. Um, and yeah, exactly. I, um, I just wanted to thank you again for for the time and um, for the inspiration around the sector. And hopefully, guys, we will be able to have your companies drive that change. Until next time. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for having us.